Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. Welcome to another episode of From the Bottom Up with my guest, special guest, Kirsten Buxton. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. We have our Christmas hats on. Oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> this was a pre recording, we were meditating. I forgot. <laughs> I'm actually right now <laughs> in a ballet watching the Moscow Bolshoi ballet dancers stream live into a Salt Lake City theater. So this was my hologram projecting into your living room because I have, I have some Christmas gifts I'd like to give you. These past few days I've had some just deep awarenesses that I really feel I'd like to, to share and extend to help keep them in my awareness. Because we've been focusing, if you've been watching my morning show, we've been focusing on really no compromise and attentiveness to the small things. Because we've been watching a movie called Fahrenheit 11.9 that Michael Moore made which is basically about how did Trump get elected over Hillary Clinton. And they show all of this music. This is my fight. Da, 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 da. And it's all like, you know, when Hillary Clinton got elected. And they're all thinking it's going to happen right oh, into... Oh, so sure. They were celebrating and popping champagne before the results came through. <laughs> <laughs> they were in full celebration. Very yeah. disappointed when mm. it flipped and Trump started winning. Mm. And then Michael Moore leaves it with, how did this happen? Mm. And he goes through this whole movie showing all of these dynamics and compromises of the mind and how when the unconscious, you know, isn't made manifest in people's minds in terms of their thoughts, this character, Trump, shows up to play it all. And today... I was kind of blown away because we just finished watching it where they showed how does it how does a society slide from democracy into despotism which could be a symbol of saying how does society flow from say sharing a symbol of sharing into autocratic rule and they said basically you take over the FBI you take over and, no, not take over, you negate the power and you say, they're liars, they're up to no good. You, you say the CIA is up to no good. You say the media, it's fake. You go through all the institutions that may have some helpful value and you, you degrade them and you basically say, I'm the only one who knows the truth. And, and basically you get people trusting you and then slowly you throw some trial balloons out there like, oh, what would a 16-year presidency look like and I like how the president of China got a life term we should do that here you throw out all these child balloons and start shifting the consciousness and then one of our pers people watching the movie which you had a thought about too asked well what do you do if this is what's going on out there and I was I was answering from the realm of well, it's no compromise. You can't let the little things slip by. You can't compromise on your feelings in what the world would call tiny situations. You have to speak up and say what you're feeling and let the ego wash through and have no compromise on following the guidance. Otherwise, you end up slipping into this realm of doing things you never thought you would do. And that's what's happening in the world. It's playing out this extreme thought system. But I wanted to hear from you. What is it you her to that question, mm. what do you do? Mm. Yeah, I think it's it's what you were just saying. It's the same thing, and I'm really warm with my hair yeah. on, so <laughs> I haven't taken off my, my Christmas hat. Um, yeah, I saw it almost like as a like a a bigger outpicturing of an inward condition, and. So when you see what happens or what's happened like with the politics and on this grand scale and you, you just go, wow, so much compromise to the point where the denial is 
unbelievable. Like how could, how could they be in such denial? How could they think that we can't see what behind and straight through what's being said? Because you, because you, you might be referring to like the Flint water crisis, where mm -hmm. there's no water problem or there's no racial problem or whatever. They're just speaking these words. Yeah. How could they? Yeah. Possibly not see that. Yeah. Yeah. And yet it's it's a state of mind. Like you're either in in such integrity with the spirit that your thoughts and words and emotions and actions line up, like that's what Jesus calls honesty. You know, honesty and integrity are the same thing. And and who really could claim total and absolute integrity and honesty mm. on a twenty four seven basis, you know, yet. <laughs> we're getting there. We're we're we're, you know, really developing this trust in the spirit, which is the ultimate foundation underneath honesty and integrity. Uh, but until that's like really solid and unwavering and therefore your connection with the truth and with the wisdom is unwavering, then there is this unconscious slipping into what is not true and believing in what is not true. So I think that's it's what's happening in consciousness, but more and more as we come on this journey, the devotion is to being transparent, you know, being upfront, being willing to just keep exposing what is in the mind, to be shown what is true, what is real, you know, what is false. So. And Michael Moore had a point even around that transparency. He said there have been other leaders who've been transparent and break the mold and don't talk like other politicians. I was even comparing him to, to Hitler. And, and he said, but what is your transparency for? Is it to expose and release? Or is it to gain a following or more power? So the transparency has to have a purpose mm. as well. Yeah, yeah, the ego can use anything, including the idea of being transparent. No, for its its own purposes, which is fake. <laughs> it's like, and then, and then that being fake, being untrue, the deception then gets projected onto anything else that would expose it. Mm. Oh. So, it's one of the ego's biggest tricks: is that kind of label and dismiss, and it's it's just always throwing off decoys to just keep the mind distracted by the avoidances of really seeing what's going on so clearly, you know, so, mm. so clearly. Because even that question Michael Moore is saying, he's like, how did this happen? Yeah, even that, like, if this is all my mind, if this is all our mind, how did, how did what happen? You know, how is it that my mind can be so asleep that, mm. that all these things can seem to be happening beyond my control and beyond my awareness and beyond mm -hmm. my understanding. You know, it's like this is really mm. taking it way beyond even the level of pretending to be a character or a person in a situation that it doesn't understand, you know, at the mercy of a crazy world or an upside down system or a broken system. It's like, well, that's actually a lie. If that's not my identity at all. So we've got to keep calling on where is the delusion? Where is the trick? Where is the deception, really? Where can it be seen so that it can be forgiven? And I can know who I am. You know, that's, mm. that's the goal. So it's quite profound even watching that whole movie and, and seeing that where you can get drawn into like, what? How could they, how could this happen, <coughs> you know, and yet even that movement of thought. I had a realization yeah. around this today, you had left the room, because I was, when I was first watching it with David, I had David here and Francis here, and we were watching the theater, I was like, because Obama goes in and drinks the water of Flint, basically saying there's no problem when you can see that the way it was set up, it was just, there was a problem, you know, dare I say that in A Course of Miracles show, there was a problem in terms of some guidance was needed and I looked at David and I'm like, Obama? 
<laughs> he's like, they're all in denial. They're all, denial runs very deep, you know. Mm-hmm. And it was like shocking because I was always asking this question, how could they, how could anybody know? And today I saw that question, how could they know, is actually a trick. They're, who's the they? Mm-hmm. There's no Donald Trump or Obama that is deciding whether to listen to the voice of the ego or the Holy Spirit. There's no decision maker there. It's the ego speaking. It's just Trump is the ego speaking. So to ask the question, how could they? It's like a layer of denial over top mm. of the whole thing. Mm. It's like, no, no, that's, that's the ego, and that's what the ego does. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and then it complicates it with you trying to figure out. But the mind that's trying to figure out, it's like there, there's right mind and wrong mind. Pure and simple, that's the simplest terms. There's right mind and wrong mind. Who am I? Who am I perceiving yeah. with? If there's a question arising, it's, you know, where is the question truly coming from? And even if, I mean, any question actually is not coming from the Christ, that Christ is the state mm-hmm. of mind that just is. And there are questions that it can be helpful to keep undoing, you know, the confusion and healing the, the, the unconscious beliefs in the direction of clarity. But ultimately, wouldn't every question that arises, mm. you know, unless it's just being used on behalf of the spirit to point, like the spirit could say, who is the I, or help you, mm-hmm. you know. But it's not con- there's no confusion behind the question. If there's confusion behind the question, it has to be there's an identity asking the question. And there's no gap between the perceiver and the perceived. Mm -hmm. It's the same mind witnessing to itself and its beliefs. That's what happened. It was like I could see that question. Well, how could Mm -hmm. anybody, if they knew that, then lie? It's like that's a a layer, an unnecessary layer of just seeing what you're saying. Well, what do I see? in this moment? Am I listening to the Spirit or believing there's a person out there that could really do such things or whatever? It's kind of cool. Yeah, that is cool. Because it really frees you. Because ultimately, if our goal is to see the innocence in our brother, it seems it's impossible when you don't know who your brother is and you don't know who the, what the motives are. And questioning s- motives. Questioning motives. And Jesus says, do not question your brother. Yeah. Do not analyze the motives of your brother. That's the mm. question. Right. Right. You take your, even your brother out of the picture. Mm-hmm. If it's pure, purely mind. E- mind. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, so this, uh, this lady continued on asking how. And so we really focused on on the how, like how does the mind slip into this place where it gets so lost that it can make these kinds of decisions and be in such denial. But before I go into it, there's a, there's a clip of another movie I could talk about. I thought maybe we could go into one of the core ideas we wanted to bring into this episode because, yeah, it was a big day yesterday. We've had some, we, the house in Europe has come in. We've We've put an offer in on the house, and so David's over there right now with Lisa, just celebrating all these miracles with the house purchase. He said he's never laughed so much as he did in Natario's office about such business transactions. They were having so much fun, and then they did more laughing somewhere else at some Burger King. Yeah, (laughs) constant laughing. (laughs) He said it was bellowing laughter. Like at the signing for this property, just everyone is in such joy, such total joy. They're so happy we're buying it because yeah. I don't know if you guys know if we've sent it on the show, we might have, but this lady was the lady who rented David and us a property in Majorca in 2010 for a six week devotional. They're the ones who own this property. And when Frank, I think you heard it from Frank last week when Frank was there with Lisa talking. They're like, you sound like this guy, David Hoffmeister, from years ago who rented the property. And we are. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, sweet Jesus. You know, like, yeah, yeah, they're just so happy, <laughs> just feeling the, the guidance and the connection behind it, all, all of it, because any kind of house purchase or anything involving Spain, for some reason, is very complicated. You keep, every, every week or every step you take, you discover something new. You have to get a military license. You have to get a military license to sell the property to a, an organization. And so it's just, and each step of the way we could, it could have gone, okay, really, are we to continue with this, looking logistically at it? But when you look at it from the miracle perspective of, is this Jesus's plan? Is this the guidance? Can we feel it? Is it lining up? It's just yes, 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 all the way through. Like the feeling is, is basically what shows us. And then, yeah, such joy. Yeah, such joy. David was telling me they were showing them the Sperry app and that it's being tra translated into Espanol. And so the daughter of the homeowner there who's selling the property, he was showing her the Sperry app in Espanol, and she was so giddy with happiness that she was going to do it, and, and she couldn't make sense of it because she couldn't come up with a problem. <laughs> she said, I have no problems. I mean, they all went around the table. None of us have problems. They were so happy. She said, unless it's unconscious. Maybe I have an unconscious problem, but <laughs> <laughs> right now in this moment, I can't come up with a problem. <laughs> so they agreed they would leave Spiru for later. <laughs> <laughs> There's a time to bring him out. <laughs> so... So Lisa, just after the whole thing went through, she just went into this deep rest and felt like her two-month mission, ah, mm -hmm. you know, it's finished. So they're over there, and we were over here helping orchestrate the transfer, and yesterday was very busy with our admin team, you know, we're walking into Aquaman movie to celebrate the end of everything, and then we get, you can do your final transfer now, and so they had to let go of the movie and do their things, and a few minutes of okay this is our priority came back into the movie and so it was the height of being done through for all of us and just really needing to step out for a moment but at the same time seeing everything is the same there's really no difference with the movie and um, at a certain point in the movie I just felt this yeah just some kind of a when he's he grabs the trident from a previous king and this big beast is there saying you're so you're the most unworthy potential king that ever existed how do you think you could possibly pick up the trident and I could just feel like wow this where this movie is going is so cool like it's not some arrogant guy that's full of confidence it's like he has to say you know you're right that is what I believe but if you're with me and you let these doubt thoughts go, basically, with me. I'm going to. I'm willing to step into my inheritance. And I could feel all this emotion and this mm -hmm. beauty, and then just sunk deeper. And then it felt like Jesus was telling me to to get off the timeline and stop thinking equality has anything to do with form. And it's, you know, you're equal in mind. You're not really training anybody in the ministry. This is not the ministry. You know, the ministry is the whole, something much, much bigger, and almost like there are many, many, many paths, and I just had this palpable feeling of it. everything is so tiny. Mm. And you just, you have to leave everybody to me. And doing is... It's tiny. Doing is, is tiny, but it has to be honored. But there's so much I want to I want to just embrace with you, and which was I need do nothing. Mm -hmm. And in that, many busy, busy doings will happen. But you're so in this quiet center, and then you felt today to just really support me in that. The truth of that. But yeah, this lesson this morning that I read was, it's lesson 65. My only function is the one God gave me. And so I just shared this with, um, this morning with Jason, that it just feels like it's a, I need do nothing as a section in the text. I mean, this is a lesson and it just feels like they, 
you know, they go hand in hand. They're really pointing to uh, a real permission to let go of responsibility and just keep coming back to the priority. Actually, that's what it feels to me. So I'll just start reading a bit and we'll just see mm-hmm. how we flow with it and what thoughts come and how it kind of ties in with everything. The idea for today reaffirms your commitment to salvation. It also reminds you that you have no other function or that you have no function other than that. I might just start that again. The idea for today reaffirms your commitment to salvation. It also reminds you that you have no function other than that. Both of these thoughts are obviously necessary for a total commitment. Salvation cannot be the only purpose you hold while you still cherish others. The full acceptance of salvation as your only function necessarily entails two phases. The recognition of salvation as your function and the relinquishment of Mm. all the other goals you have invented for yourself. So that to me just immediately speaks to like whenever there's a feeling of I need to, I must, I'm responsible to or for something, Mm -hmm. it immediately there is this redirect and this full permission to come back to, oh, that's right, whatever else it is, unless it feels like it's truly coming from my heart, from the heart of God, and it's for the peace of my mind, then I have, I'm being given permission to basically let it go you know, and put this first. Because part of my assignment is I'm like a conductor because there's so many projects going on right now with the book and the apps out and payment for Spain. How a major property sale. There's a big project at the monastery. Right. Oh, yeah. Superstructure. A big, a big structure being built. So a lot of people are leading these assignments. And I'm mm-hmm. I'm in because I have these relationships with them all. And, and then somehow we were just talking to David today. And like if a conductor goes and plays the instrument for the musician, or even tries to play beside them so that they can tune in with them. He's missing. He can't do his role and the whole thing. Really, the assignment to just step back goes down. So something, somehow when we were talking to David, that that stuck out even more. Like a conductor is a conductor. And then he even said, if you really believe you're a conductor or an air traffic controller, that's stressful. Mm-hmm. Like making sure the planes don't crash. or It can serve for a while to just be in the precision, but In the end, you even have to step out of that role of conductor and air traffic controller and just accept the more abstract spaces of mind that want to come in and give yourself permission to go with it. And then he'll, he'll pull you out at the right time. Yeah. And I I was even saying just a few minutes ago to the whole team here because because a lot of people had a lot of emotion after that movie, the Trump. They call it Trump, but... 11-9. Fahrenheit 11-9. And I said, yeah, you have to give yourself full permission to let that emotion come up. And then I was just telling them a story where I just had, yeah, just a lot of depression. That's something that I never really felt before came up. And you have to give it so much permission, just like you have to let yourself go into the abstract. And when the guidance comes in to, to keep the abstract or to, it's time to step out of that movement coming through. You know, he's so precise, and I just had this mission. I had headed 
he said, go to Bellingham, Washington right now and call this girl and call her name was Shirley. And so I just got on the phone and called her and just had all these miracles down there, unbelievable miracles that I don't feel necessarily to repeat right now. But the miracles are always there to just help keep the abstract going. If you're starting to slip out mm -hmm. and ego thoughts are coming, he's like, get back into your miracle working. Mm -hmm. Or if you have darkness that's moving through and it's time to not wallow in it now. Get back into your miracle working. So. Yeah, because in the miracle working, there's this element of I am not in control. You know, that's the whole point mm. of the miracle is they're not under conscious control. Jesus performs them through us, and our part is to be willing and ready, and available. So when when it feels like we are consciously in control, even of our area, our function, it, it's. It's another word for personal responsibility. Yeah, it's no miracle working. In it's no, we lose the joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I love that. It's like the prompt is just keep coming back to give it all over, let it all go. You know, even a thousand times a day being willing to just let it go. Like that's what I do. I give myself permission. If ever I start to feel like I'm responsible in some way, mm. I just like okay I'm just I let it all go and remember at first that was kind of scary because I was like because it seems to take so much willingness to take on whatever you know God has given us to steward and to, to, to care for I even had some emotion last time I was on your show about that like whatever it is that's part of our pathway we really fully pour our heart into but as soon as it starts to feel like it's not for our heart, you know, even for a moment or a minute, you know, as soon as it's felt, it's like it's a, it's a direction for our mind of come back to this. My only function is the one God gave me or truly I need you nothing to come back into the miracle. And then from there, <coughs> you may be activated within a second, you know, <laughs> or maybe you're to meditate for an hour or maybe the plan gets revealed to you in a new way. But, How did you, yeah. when you first told me about that, you made, made you think of Aquaman? Like not to take on things that aren't for you. Yeah, well the very next line. Okay. <laughs> this is the only way in which you can take your rightful place oh. among the saviors of the world. Mm. <laughs> Because he was in quite denial of his magnitude. Mm -hmm. He was playing around on the surface. <laughs> 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 Pretending to be a man. But really. But really, he was Aquaman. <laughs> and he needed to go into the depths. And, like, really into the depths, too. He had to go through the trench, the abyss. He had to face all his doubt thoughts and his unworthiness. And he had to basically accept that he had a calling. Yeah, so... Yeah. So basically this full acceptance is the only way in which you can take your rightful place among the saviors of the world. This is the only way in which you can say and mean my only function is the one God gave me. And this is the only way in which you can find peace of mind. I can carry on. There are other really nice lines in here. Okay. Today's idea offers you escape from all your perceived difficulties. Oh, so when we were going to see the movie, David had said Aquaman will he heal or cure like 75% of all your problems. Because <laughs> basically it's like you watch that movie and it's just, it's all in there from unworthiness and denial of true identity, you know, all the way through to true identity. And here, this lesson, so Aquaman and this lesson 65. Yeah. Today's idea offers you escape from all your perceived difficulties. It places the key to the door of peace, which you have closed upon yourself in your own hands. It gives you the answer to all the searching you have done since time began. I mean, that's just, yeah, that's so beautiful. I love it when it, it just brings it back to, 
you know, you've closed the door upon yourself and this place is the key within your own hands. It's so practical. It's basically you have the answer and it's just let go of whatever else you think your purpose is and your function is and what you have to do mm. and accept that your one function is this relationship with God. You know, this is everything. And then he goes into that this lesson is the purpose of this lesson and arranging your day so that you have set apart the time for God is part of a long range disciplinary training your mind needs so that the Holy Spirit can use it consistently for the purpose he shares with you. So, yeah, he's really bringing in that this is part of a long range plan and a disciplinary training because it's, yeah, they can be beautiful words, but, you know, as we know, it just takes a lot of seeing what are the other purposes and where is it that, that my mind believes that there is another function more important right now than my peace of mind. He kept going through that training, mm. learning how to use a trident and swim, and we were showing it through the movie, but I thought it was interesting when he kept trying to meet his mother who had left, left him when he was young to save him because the king would have come and killed him if he knew where he was, and so she had to leave. And then they banished the queen, her, to the secret underworld, but they thought she was dead. And so finally, after a certain level of training, when am I going to meet my mother? And they said, she's been banished, maybe even dead. And he's like, what? She didn't love me? She left me because of me? So it was my fault that she left? And so this unworthiness was already coming up. So all the training was really to prepare him to flush up this unworthiness. He wasn't ready until a certain point. So he had to face as much as he could, and then when he found she was alive, you know, it was like this giant boost to him to face the real unworthiness instead of it being reflected by, my mother left me. It was this internal voice that he had to face from this myth mythical beast. Mm. And yeah, and this is the, all of this relates to Christmas because we're using Aquaman and function God gave me, but this is the resurrection, you know, Aquaman went through his resurrection, letting all the doubt thoughts come up and accept his Aquamanness, <laughs> <laughs> accept his Christhood by letting all the doubt thoughts go. And he never wanted to be king, I mean, he never wanted to, to be an authority, which is what made him a good king, he just wanted to peace. He, he only reason he took on the job was because he didn't want the surface to fight with the, mm. the dwellers, the, the underwater dwellers from Atlantis and different places. So his purpose was unification. And there was a good line actually at one point where they said something like, one of the kings just wanted to be a kingdom of the underwater and the other wanted to be a king on top, but you're a true king because there isn't two worlds, there isn't a surface and an underwater, there's one world. And there was a unification line. Can you accept that that one world is your only goal? His mother says to him. If you can, then you're ready to be king. And somehow he said yes on some level. And, or maybe it was the other woman, the red-haired woman that said that. But so there's really some fantastical scenes and worlds and we'd probably recommend 3D but <laughs> if you see it from this perspective of facing your demons and bringing the worlds together then mm. it's pretty cool mm. yeah yeah because it is it is an integration wherever there's that like the split, then that's really what's being healed.
You got another line for us? I do have another line because like this, this lesson, it's like, you know, a lot of times the, the question can be asked, what is forgiveness? You know, what is forgiveness? And, and Jesus does go into that, but he also really focus on, focuses on what forgiveness is not. And, mm, he, and the, forgiveness to destroy, he calls it. Yeah, the ego's use of forgiveness is more just um, to say I'm better than you, and so I'll, you know, overlook your error. So basically, I believe that you've done something wrong, but I'll forgive you for it. You know, that is not forgiveness. And and several forgiveness to destroy that really just maintain a sense of separation. And in here as well, it's like you can go through this lesson and go, okay, great, yep, salvation's my function, but what is that? You know, what is what is that exactly? If you're not in the experience mm. of it, it's like, okay, my only function's the one God gave me, but can you be specific? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does that actually mean? Because the mind is so used to doing and go and be, wanting to lock into it, to know it, to be able to to have it. But what he's doing here is more saying this idea offers you escape from all your perceived difficulties. And he's, he's basically saying when you say this, you're accepting mm -hmm. that you, you only have one function. So let yourself see all of the other functions you think you have. Mm -hmm. And as you let them go, there's a line here. On this clean slate, let my true function be written for me. Mm. So the goal is emptying consciousness. Mm. You know, it's it's removing the blocks to love's awareness. Mm. It's allowing the false purposes, the egoic purposes, the personal responsibility to be identified and consciously seeing it and letting it go and coming back to accepting, even if I don't know what it means mm. in this moment, but my only function is the one God gave me and in that just breathing through it and allowing the mm. space for that mm. you are accepting mm. your function that God has given you it's like show me what I believe mm. another way of saying what's what's the what's against my function is helpful like show me mm. because we've this guy in this episode that uh, I'm not going to show, but I've talked about several times the past few days. It's called The Push. And uh, he basically, okay, there's this magician, Darren Brown, and he gets these people on his show, and they all apply months in advance because they all feel static or stagnant in their life. And so they apply knowing that they're going to go through some kind of a rocky period. And he he gets them to come in for like these job interviews or different things and they don't know they're on the show, right? But they've made this prayer to show me mm. the conditions that are keeping me from this one salvation. So this one guy gets on the show and it's like the episode, it's like a movie, The Game, where Michael Douglas has to go through all these stage scenarios but he loses track, is it the real or is it not? And this guy comes on, he has no idea that 70 actors have been hired for this giant experiment to see if societal pressure, people pleasing, can get you to commit murder, he says in his British accent. Murder. <laughs> murder. <laughs> <laughs> and basically this is the answer to that lady's question of how can you end up so far away where you're in such layers of denial? One small step at a time away from your true function compromise. Mm -hmm. And in this, the first thing that they get him to do is, this guy, it's an actor, remember, but he dies. He thinks he's dying. Goes to get his drugs to help him, but he doesn't, he dies. And it's this big scenario that's set up for this um, shindig to raise money for homeless people or some, some kind of great charity. And basically, in order to not have the charity go down, they, he agrees to hide the body just until the charity's over. So they hide the body. So that's the first step on a slippery slope. Exactly. <laughs> Hides the body. Exactly. And then, he doesn't realize it, but the guy was the one who was going to give the speech to raise all the money, and he had his speech all prepared out. So the guy who's hosted the thing, look, man, 
you were going to come here to be a waiter, but I want you to get up there and read the speech, and you're going to be the one, because they don't know what he looks like. So he's like, are you kidding me? How can I? He's like, just do it. You can just do it. And he's like, okay. So he gets up in front of these 70 so actors. So that's the second step. The second step. On this dark, slippery slope. And Jesus says, if you take a first step on this dark, slippery slope, the rest will surely follow, and you will not know, you know, how you got to where you end up because the rest follow and then they're so out of awareness it's like you just like descend really mm. quickly that's it mm. that's exactly it mm. so he gets up there and gives a speech <laughs> as if he's this dead guy <laughs> and by the end everyone thinks he's this guy so now he's this big hot shot now he's in this false self-confident thing then they get these actors to give subliminal messages famous <laughs> actors Stephen Fry all these ones that he recognizes saying, come on, one more push and we're going to get some funds for this thing. And Lie after lie after lie until the guy that was dead was actually in a coma, wakes up and isn't dead and is so angry at them putting them in this box instead of calling the hospital to help him when he was in this coma. And he feels so guilty and they're about to lose all the money and everything's going to be exposed and he's going to go to prison. That the only solution is they have all this screaming, push, push, push. And he said this. So he pushes the guy off a building to kill him in order to alleviate the guilt. And you would never believe that that would happen, but through small, small compromise, mm -hmm. it happens. And so all of those compromises of people pleasing and pride and self concept get revealed in this episode. Mm -hmm. So without someone there, it's a pretty hard episode to watch. That's, we're walking you through it, but yeah, I don't know. I think of that one. <laughs> Looking at the negation. That's how you avoid Christmas, is one small compromise. Being frazzled, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is how you avoid being frazzled at Christmas. Like truly, the, the, the message of Christmas and the purpose of Christmas is to remember who we are. You know, it's, like this rebirth in awareness. Anytime it's forgotten, it can be a, a rebirth of the awareness of Christ's presence. And what is Christ's presence but love, you know, innocence, just to have that worthiness to, to know that we need to do nothing to even feel the, the love of the Spirit. So, yeah, that's what it is. It's like compromise and then one leads to the next, and once you've done it in one, you think, oh, well, I might as well just keep going. And mm. you know, before you know it, you're just frazzled. You're tired or you're stressed or mm. you've just added on. You know, the ego is the, like the sneaky little add-on thing, and it will just add on mm. and add on and add on. And, yeah, the more you add on, the further away from the connection you get. So... But the good news is at any moment you can just stop and come back, come home. Realize it's all a game. Like that's what happens at the very end. Mm. They do it and they feel so bad and they're so guilty. And then Darren Brown walks out and they know because they've signed it and they realize that they've been part of this whole act. And they're just, they, he, he's ready to grab them. They've got these people. And he, they fall into his arms and they just cry and cry and cry like, it's not real. Oh. I didn't kill somebody. Oh my God. <laughs> That's intense. <laughs> That's an intense way to learn to listen. <laughs> Nothing ever happened. And, the, and they actually have gratitude after for seeing mm. all that they mm. compromised on and how they could, the life they must be living now, that they would compromise in that kind of a way. So they're, they're grateful actually for <laughs> Just like Michael Douglas was grateful for the game. Yeah. I mean, that's the only way we can look at it. It's like, okay, somehow this can all be used to help us wake up. Mm. <sighs> Radical. And I guess if you can do it at night, that's pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Brave two hours. Wow, two hours. Actually, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> now you'll watch it with me. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I'm not going to watch This <laughs> child is not interested. No, I'm like, wow. Actually, if you look at it like a, the movie Lucy, you know, that was fast. It was like 48 hours. 
and it was extreme. It was intense, you know, what she went through. But mm. as far as in terms of like the speed up, it's like highly motivated, mm. you know, highly motivated to to realize her function and yeah, get out of the nightmare. That was a positive mm. take on it. So it's better. This is better. Mm. Well, do you have any more lines, or is that it? That was your last line. That's it. Well, I think we'll just end with with that. Yeah, thank you for joining us in this Christmas special. <laughs> Santa and his helper. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got my Monday show tomorrow, but this is a Merry Christmas to you and to you. And have a good, uh, have a good Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? You say Merry Christmas. <laughs> we wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. And a Happy New Year. <laughs> Much love, everyone. Thank you. Love you. <laughs>